Miss Mary, age 98, had lived independently for some time before moving to a nursing home. Sometime later, she had the chance to leave that nursing home and move in with her grandson Billy and his wife Susan. In this video, you will hear from Miss Mary, two sexual assault advocates, and several criminal justice professionals. Some of the footage in this video may be difficult to view as it contains graphic content and photographs of serious injuries. Every month, when he bring his check in, they blow it. They didn't have no money to pay a mortgage, $500 a month mortgage. And they said, Granny, have you got any money? So I get my next check and I'll pay you back. I let him have it. I gave him two $500 checks at one time that I'd say two at one time. And I said, now Bill, go pay that mortgage. And what changed, I said, bring it back. Come back a drinking. I never did see none. I never have seen none of my money. It sounded like pretty much from the start there was problems with that not only with her government check being misused, um, they would drive her to the bank, they would have her cash it, they would immediately you know, go buy things, but not things for Mary. Mary would request, one of her favorite things is chocolate milk to this day, <laughs> she loves chocolate milk. Um, she would request that they would buy her chocolate milk at the grocery store and give her, they would, she would give them money. Those kind of requests were never, you know, were never made. She would make her own food and make dinner for them. Um, and they would just kind of come in haphazardly, um, not really appreciating or acknowledging anything that she was doing. Um, the fact that she's, you know, in her late 80s and 90s at this point when this was all going on, she was doing primarily the housework from what it sounds like, was doing the cooking for the family, um, was really taking care of them <laughs> instead of them taking care of her. I think she felt lucky in the sense that she did not want to be at a nursing home, so she felt like she was lucky to have her things and be kind of out in the real world. Um, and so she did whatever she could to make that family work, um, make that situation work. I had to give them all the best I could. And I didn't say nothing. Mary had told me that they had gone, she had gone on a regular basis to put some of her um, government check into a burial policy so that when she passed, everything would be taken care of. I, I, I was trying to save a little bit of money because I was paying on my funeral bill, you know, how, and um, I gave her money. I gave her money to go in there and pay it. And she go in there and she come back. I stayed in the truck. I said, did they give you a receipt? She said, no, they don't give a receipt. And, well, I went on. <laughs> Next month come, I gave her some more money. And I said, did you give her a receipt? She said, no. I said, they didn't give no receipt in there. The third time, I gave her some money. She went and come too fast, too quick. She went and come right quick. I said, well, that was quick going and coming. She said, yes, yeah. there wasn't nobody there. She said, I just opened the door and walked in there and put the money on the desk and come on out. That's whenever I called her. But I didn't say nothing. I didn't say a word. This is certainly a situ situation where there was ongoing misuse of the elders' money and assets. And that was going on for a very long time. Typically in these cases, what we find is that while the financial exploitation might become obvious if someone's really looking at it, what's not obvious is that there will be power and control issues that come in as whoever's doing the exploitation seeks to gain more and more control over the elder's assets. And that's where you start seeing physical violence, sexual violence, things escalate, as in domestic violence of all kinds. Family violence against elders is domestic violence, and the power and control issues are always there. 911, Thompson. Yeah. 
can I cough out here? I'm hurt. Ma'am, you need police or rescue. Okay, and he'll be coughed out here. Okay, ma'am. Okay, okay, you need it. What's your address? Okay, listen to me, okay? Take yes. a deep breath, okay? Who are you having a problem with? Ma'am? Who are you having a problem with? I don't know, but please, please. Uh, oh, listen to me, ma'am. Who are you? Please, will you listen? Will you listen to me, please? You said it's a maniac in your house. Who's in your house? Well, he's in the house. He hurt me. I'm bleeding. Thank you, please. Please hurry. Please hurry. She was had so many bruises on her. I hadn't seen anybody with that many bruises before. Um, all down her arms and legs and. Um, her, she had gauze everywhere, and there was, it was just, it was really hard to walk in there and to see her. You know, it was done at night, late night on a Sunday afternoon, about 6 o'clock. And it went on till 2 o'clock in the morning, on Monday morning, 2 o'clock Monday morning. It went on that long. And he was so drunk. And um, I when he said, I'm going to, I'm going to rub you down. He said, I'm going to rub you down tonight. And he just went to scrubbing on me, all over me. And I went over that way. I said, don't, don't, Bill, quit. And he got worse and worse. He jerked me up. And he, um, I, I tried to say something to put him off, you know. And so I said, there's somebody at the door, Bill. And he jerked me up out of my chair. And he, had me to the door. See, of course, there wasn't nobody at the door. And he grabbed me up and went and pulled me in on his bed and laid me, rubbed me back out, and come throw me back in the house. He kept on dragging me around in there. I said, Bill, I gotta go to the bathroom. He, he wouldn't turn me loose. He wouldn't. He had to hope for me. I said, I gotta go to the bathroom. So he um, opened the bathroom door, and I went in the bathroom. He followed me in there, had a hold of me. And uh, I said, damn, I, and he, I had to say this, but it, it's the truth. That's what the old moment is, the truth. Yeah. He rubbed his finger all in my face. His penis, mm -hmm. he rubbed it all in my face. And um, I told him, I said, I said, I won't go back in that room. He yelled me back in the room and I sat down. He shoved me down. He had to hold my hands. And he yelled me, from there, he yelled me out to the back door, opened his back glass door. And I cut my hand, must cut my hand on the door when he yelled me through there. It's on? From here to here. Mm -hmm. 18 stitches. And two, hey, there was two in my ankle. And he jumped me out and I told him, he said, I, I'm going to the little house. I got some beer out there. I, yeah, he said, I got two more beer. I said, well, you go get, go get the beer and I'll have you drink it. You know, I was just telling him that, you know, make him turn me loose. He said, no, I'm going to carry you with me. So he jumped me out the back porch, down the doorsteps, barefooted, just had my night clothes on, down to the little house, and back is dragging me. He said, I'm going to kill you anyhow. He said, I'm going to kill you before daylight. Now, he, he told me that, dragging me, dragging me, and dragging me. I'm going to kill you before daylight. Nobody won't know who done it. And I cut my knee across here on something out in the yard. Mm -hmm. It had grass and gravel all in it. And I, uh, Got back in the house, he slammed me down, and he took me his fingers and put them by my nose and twisted it around. And my face was black and blue, my hands was all cut up, and um, he said, "Well, it's time to go to bed." I said, "Well, you going to go to bed, Bill?" And um, he said, "No." He jugged me in my room. And he got in my bed, 
and um, he didn't have no clothes on. He told me to get up there in the bed with him. I said, I'm not getting up there. And he, um, he could lay down on his back in my bed. He was, my bed was about like this. And um, so I was trying to find a way to get away from him. So he lay down and I felt him when he yelled. And I dug my hand out from under him, for he had a hold of it. And I went in there and I called 911. I said, there are many acts in the house. And I said, he's just about killed me. I said, I'm bleeding to death. And uh, so they come out and found him in my bed. And they got him up, put handcuffs on him, put him in the car. I I will never forget the day that case hit the office because earlier in the in the year and the previous year, we had had a a sixty-some uh, year old victim assaulted by a family member and a seventy-eight year old victim assaulted by her natural son. And in this business, when you work in in these kind of specialty crimes of of domestic violence and and sexual abuse, every day you think, uh, you know that tops it, you'll never hear anything worse. And then this file comes in with Lisa of a 96 year old victim assaulted by her 38 or 37 year old grandson. I think that the exploitation was going on. Uh, clearly there was emotional abuse going on where she was pretty much the servant and w her wishes were being ignored and there were expectations that she would basically work for Susan and I, I just see the situation escalating and escalating in pretty much a classic sort of sense. Now all of a sudden Billy rapes Mary and it seems like something that came out of the blue but when you start really digging into what else was going on it's not quite so out of the blue. It's shocking in that it had a sexual aspect of it, but, but not so shocking when you think of it as part of this whole package of exploitation and abuse, I think, that was going on. Adult Protective Services was made aware of Miss Mary's case. They substantiated the abuse and assisted in finding long-term care for Miss Mary. Pretty much right from the beginning, um, Mary wanted to see the photos that were taken of her, and it was very important for her to not only see them, but she wanted a copy. That's where I drug to. That's where you, that's I, where. I can't have a CD for pay. Yeah, I know, but he pulled you down these steps. Steps to this section, to this little house. Down to this, okay. And it was little bit for For Mary, it seemed more like a validation for her. I think the whole situation was so shocking. And that first week I saw her every day in the hospital, she was in pure shock that, that first week. And so for her, I think after time had gone by and looking at those pictures was like, yes, this really happened to me. I'm not making this up, um, especially because the family was so insistent that this didn't happen. That, that really helped her to realize that it, it did happen. We were very, very concerned that other family members would come in and dissuade her from testifying or convince her that it didn't really happen um, or, or that something like that would happen. So um, I think when you hear Ashley talk, she'll actually call uh, Miss Mary JD, and that's because we initially had her as a, a Jane Doe. Everyone at the nursing home refers to her as JD. Um, she has, <coughs> excuse me, since she still is in the same place and um, obviously the security is, is, is lessened but you know when we still go by there they still do ask that we sign in and make sure that they check where we're from and everything because there still are issues with some of her family members. The trial took eight days which is incredibly long for this state where we have full discovery. It, it is very unusual for a criminal trial to take that kind of time especially in light of the fact that there w it wasn't a particularly big trial. There weren't a whole lot of witnesses, but as I mentioned before, uh, defense counsel was rather verbose. You know, going into the courtroom, it, it is divided on, on two sides, and you know, everyone that was pretty much against her was on one side, and then everyone that was for her was on the other side. It's 
sadly, the people that were for, were for her were people that she had met after this had happened. It was, you know, her advocate, it was Nancy, it was people from our office that were there, that had an interest in the case, that believed her, that, that were there to show their support for her because it was so against her. What Cheyenne did and what the you know attorneys who prosecute these cases often do for children and, and uh, aged victims um, is they move closer with consent of the court and move closer to them providing just a, a little bit more maybe physical support by being closer. Well the tactic of the defense attorney was just the opposite and moved farther away and it was uh, it was excruciating to watch uh, and was probably 15 or 20 feet away from her, as Cheyenne said, with the apparent purpose of making her look incompetent um, and to demonstrate to the jury that she was not a good witness. Just because of, of the tactics that were used, how long it went on, we were very worried that the jury was going to let him go. And, and I think one of the things you have to understand in dealing with these types of cases more than anything is one of the greatest obstacles we come in contact with with a jury is the first thing you have to get them over is the concept that something like this could happen. Juries don't ever want to believe that sexual abuse happens, but put that aside, a grandson on a grandmother, and that is a huge obstacle that you face. You start back in a case like this, not ra rather than on an even playing field. And the only thing that Cheyenne and I really could do was just from the outset explain to the jury again and again and again that that's not our job and that we can't give motive. We simply, we cannot tell you why he did this. We have no idea and you have to accept that that's something that we can't do. And you know, when you asked before, are we worried about the verdict? Well, when I spent 20 minutes in closing argument saying, we cannot tell you why he did this, and I say, see these blank stares coming back at me, of course, we're worried about the verdict. One of the things that she did not want to do was wind up in a nursing home, in a facility. And so that from, from the f physical and emotional standpoint, um, she was in her, her worst case scenario a after becoming a victim. She will have pain for the rest of her life in areas of her body that were affected by the assault and talks about that at every visit when I see her. One of the complications in her healing was that for, for most victims, Af it, while the sexual assault experience is a very powerless and helpless experience, afterwards um, advocates and loved ones mobilize to help the victim regain control of her life. And that simply di didn't and couldn't happen in this case because Miss Mary had to go, as John said, to the place of her greatest nightmare, to a nursing home. And it's a very good nursing home and they've taken great care of her, but it is a nursing home. She didn't even have the opportunity to choose the nursing home and so she had no control over where she lives. Then people are still doing things to her body in caregiving her that are not of her choice. In addition, because she's so isolated from family members, her only visitors are her three advocates. And she has healed emotionally and physically far beyond what I ever believed she could. But there is that chronic inability to regain control of her life and her body that I think for me has been one of the most painful things to participate in, in a case. I'm having to suffer for what he done. I'm having to suffer for what he done. 